my name is Yevgeny Epifanovsky. I'm a staff scientist at QCAM. And it's my great pleasure to introduce to you today a duo of speakers um, at our webinar. Um, the first is Professor Roy Baer of uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Um, Professor Baer received his PhD from Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 1996, after which he um, moved to Berkeley and spent some time with Professor Martin Head Gordon's group at the University of California, Berkeley. And after that, he returned to Israel to um, Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and now um, he's a professor there. And our second speaker is Dr. Tamar, um, Tamar Stein. Um, she received her PhD with Professor Roy Baer, and now she's a postdoc with um, Professor Gustavo Cusurillo's group at Rice University. Um, now let me um, switch um, to Roy Baer, who's going to present his talk now. Hello, everybody. My name is Roy Baer. And, uh, I will talk today together with uh, Tamar Stein from Rice University uh, about tuning the range-separated hybrid and breathing life into your orbital energies. Um, <clears throat> let me start. Let me start by thanking, uh, first of all, the QCAM staff, the developers, and especially I'd like to mention Yi Han Shao, who is always helping us a lot in development and various problems that we sometimes face with um, QCAM <clears throat> programming. I would also like to uh, acknowledge uh, students and collaborators, Dr. Esther Lifshitz, who is a research associate in my group, and Dr. Ellen Eisenberg, who is also a research associate. And also I'd like to acknowledge Ms. Sivan Raffaelli Abomson from the Weizmann Institute, who is a student of uh, Professor Leo Kronik, who is also um, my, my main uh, collaborator on many of the issues I will speak about at the Weizmann Institute. S some work which I will not speak on today was done by my student at Vabarats, who is finishing her PhD these days. And collaborate, other collaborators are Daniel Neuhauser from UCLA and Ulrike Salzner from Wilkent University. Funding of our research comes from the Israel Science Foundation and from the Binational Science Foundation, U.S. Israel. So let us start. Um, <clears throat> I'm showing here a cartoon taken from a paper in Nature Materials from about 10 years ago, uh, discussing the issue of disensitized uh, solar cells. So in this case, you have nanocrystalline titanium oxide film and uh, glued on it are some uh, sensitizer dye molecules which uh, absorb photon energies and the excited electron in these molecules is transferred to the titanium oxide and then moves until it reaches the electrode. Simultaneously, the hole that is left in the molecule goes through the polymer gel over here, reaches the other electrode, and then the electron flows through the circuit to recombine with the hole, doing some useful work for us. This is the principle of the of this type of solar cells. Now, if we want to understand this, uh, the operation of the solar cell in more detail, we the least we need to know is the energetics of these two two charged particles that I just mentioned: the electron that goes here and the hole that goes to the other side. And uh, in order to do that, you actually need to have what what is called the quasi the uh, charge carrier levels. So this is, for example, the ionization potential of the of the organic molecule, and this is the optically excited state of the electron after it absorbs a photon. And in order for the cell to operate, this level must be higher than the uh, minimum of the conduction band of the titanium oxide. So you have here what we like to call alignment 
of levels which is necessary for the operation. So if we want to study these type of systems theoretically, and if we want to be able to control them, we must uh, know those energies. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, experimentalists, they have these lists of ionization potential and electron affinity of various systems. And these uh, differences are called the gaps. And then they can compare the en these energies to the energies of various molecules. And they can determine experimentally if uh, um, the energies are going to, if the electron can flow through the system like here or not. But if we want a better theory, we have to develop a, a theory of charge carriers in materials. And these charge carriers are called quasi-particles. So there, we like to think of single particles, but these quasi-particles are actually manifestation of many particles glued together. If we add an electron to a system, since this electron repels other electrons, it gets coated by an effective positive cloud. And so the electron plus the positive cloud acts like a particle, and we can call it quasi-electron. The same happens if we have a hole. We take an electron out of a molecule. Since the hole is effectively a positive entity, it attracts other electrons, and it gets coated by a negative cloud. So that's also a quasi-hole. And uh, I took this picture from uh, uh, Richard Mattox's guide to the Feynman diagrams. Uh, here we have a real horse, uh, but if the horse is running, it creates a whole uh, dust cloud. And so the horse plus the dust cloud is actually a quasi-horse, quasi-particle. We need a theory for these quasi-particles. Now, there is an exact theory of quasi-particles which has been developed by several researchers. One of them is Hedin, already in the 50s and 60s. But this theory, it's exact, so it's, it's as difficult as solving the entire electronic structure problem. There is, however, a good approximation called GW approximation, but it, too, is very expensive numerically and therefore difficult to apply. So molecules with many uh, electrons are out of the game, and also periodic solids with large unit cells cannot be treated by GW. Um, GW not only gives us the numbers, it gives us a nice picture. So for a given system, like a molecule, we have these levels called Dyson levels, or Dyson energies. These levels are actually the levels of the quasi-particles. So uh, uh, it's the level of the energy it takes to make a hole or to take out the electron to infinity. And this level, the empty one, is, is actually the energy you get by putting an electron. So we, in chemistry, we also call this level the ionization potential, and this level the electron affinity. But if you like, you can also call it the quasi-hole quasi energy and the electron quasi-electron energy. Now, if you make simultaneously a quasi-hole and a quasi-electron, then you get this picture which looks a little bit like an excitation. And the energy to do that, if the hole and the electron are non-interacting, is called the quasi-particle gap. It's just I minus A. But in reality, the hole is positively charged, and the electron is negatively charged. And so they attract. And the energy of the electron-hole pair is actually smaller than the quasi-particle gap. This energy is called the optical gap, and it's really the photon energy needed to make an excitation in the system. So the excitation energy is viewed in this theory of quasi-particles as first making non-interacting two particles, a hole and an electron, and then letting them interact coulombically and calculating this interaction energy, which is called the electron-hole binding energy. So this is a nice way to look at ex electronic excitations in materials. Now, as I said, GW is very expensive numerically, and density function theory is a much easier theory. Can we, and density function theory also has orbitals and orbital energies. Maybe the orbital energies of density function theory are a good approximation to these Dyson levels or the quasi-particle levels of GW. Can we do that? And it turns out that in some cases, yes, but in other cases, no. So let's look at that more closely. What if density functional theory 
it is a theory in which we have the Kornshan uh, mapping. This mapping is unique between our interactive system and a non-interacting electron system which has the same density. And so the mapping is unique. That is proved by Korn and Hoenberg and by Korn and Shan. And uh, therefore, it's meaningful. And uh, uh, once we can find this non-interacting system, we know it has the same density. And therefore, any quantity which is determined by the density directly is the same for both systems. However, any particle which is not directly determined by the density is usually different between the two systems. So it's not clear that what we can gain from the Kornshan system. But one thing we can gain for sure, and that's a little bit of a surprise, but it turns out to be correct. And that is that the ionization potential of the two systems, the interacting and non-interacting, is the same. The reason is that a density always decays far from the system, like an exponential, and the exponential factor is dependent on the ionization potential of the system. And therefore, uh, two systems that have the same density will decay, the density will decay the same way when R goes to infinity, and therefore they will must have the same ionization potential. And since the Kornsham system and the real system have the same density, we arrive at the conclusion that the ionization potential of the Kornsham system, which is just minus the homo energy, equals the ionization potential of the real system, which is I. And therefore, you have an exact theorem in Kornsham theory that the energy of the homo orbital equals exactly the ionization potential of the real system not only of the non-interacting system. So, and this is the quasi-particle energy. So, homo energy of the EFT can be taken as the quasi-whole energy. It can in principle, but can it in practice? So, we can test it. We can do a DFT calculation like using PB, and we can see that the homo energy of various molecules like fluorine 2, nitrogen 2, etc., the homo energy here it's 9 electron volt, 10 electron volt, 6 electron volt, is very different from the ionization potential, which is 15, 15, and 11. The difference is, is many electron volts. So, in spite of the fact that Kornsham theory actually says that I equals minus homo energy, in practice, the usual functionals, those that we like to use, give a deviation of several electron volts, which is really a big number. So, we have a partial answer for the usefulness of DFT. In principle, it's exact. In practice, it is not. What about the homo energy? So, we will talk about the fundamental gap. That's the ionization potential minus the electron affinity. Or you can think of it as the electron uh, ionization potential of the neutral system minus the uh, ionization potential of the anion. Um, this is the quasi-particle gap. Now, if you you can write it in terms of the homo energies of two Kornshan systems, the Kornshan system that corresponds to the anion and the Kornshan system, homo of the Kornshan system that corresponds to the neutron. That's exact because of the IP theory. However, when we say the Kornshan gap, we mean the lumo energy of the neutral system and the homo energy of the neutral system. This is the Kornshan gap. It's not necessarily equal to the exact gap. There is a difference, and this difference is called delta xc, or in words we call it derivative discontinuity. And so this derivative discontinuity is just the difference between the homo of the n plus 1 system and the lumo of the m electron system, the neutral. And uh, you might say, OK, this derivative discontinuity, it's probably a small quantity. Let me show you that it's not. Take, for example, the fluorine atom. No matter what exa the exact constant treatment is for the fluorine atom, because there's an odd number of electrons in the atom, the homo level of the constant system will be equal exactly to the lumo level. So that means that the constant gap is zero. But IP of fluorine and electron affinity of fluorine, they're very big numbers, and their difference is 14 electron volts. So you can see that this derivative discontinuity could even be as big as 14 electron volts. And uh, this relates to a paradox. 
uh, noted by Purdue and co-workers. Uh, take, for example, a system like hydrogen and fluorine atoms far away from each other. We can ask what is more stable, the neutral system or the charge transfer system. Now, we can look at the Concham orbitals and see what, what uh, Concham theory says. By the way, uh, experiment says that the neutral system is more stable than the charge transfer system. So this is the Concham level of the hydrogen we know, and this would be the Concham level of the fluorine. We know that too because we know the, um, the ionization potential of fluorine is here, and the ionization potential of uh, hydrogen is higher, it's here. Now, because the LUMO is the same energy as the HOMO for fluorine, then actually the LUMO of fluorine is lower than the HOMO of hydrogen. That means that this electron will want to come here and create a charge transfer state in the ground state. But when we put the two atoms together, it turns out, then that this HOMO air, uh, orbital suddenly senses the existence of the electron on the hydrogen, and it jumps discontinuously, exactly by the derivative discontinuity. And that makes this level equal or even higher than the HOMO level here. And therefore, they, they become equal and there's no charge transfer state. And this derivative discontinuity is a very strange phenomenon which the exact Konchan potential must have. So the situation, if we summarize, is the following. You have the quasi-particle gap here. It's I and A. And then you have the Konchan gap. It's much smaller. It's smaller by a quantity called delta Hc. The homo level of the Konchan theory must equal the ionization potential. So it must, this situation must look like this. However, when you use the usual functionals, which are approximations, you get this typical situation. The HOMO is not at the correct place. It's displaced upwards by half of the derivative discontinuity, more or less. And the LUMO, it goes up as well by half of the derivative discontinuity, and therefore it's too high. And so you get this gap instead of this gap, and instead of this gap. So first of all, the Konchang theory, the exact one is not, you don't have quasi-particle levels, at least in the LUMO, but also the approximations are doing bad things. So our so DFT at this stage cannot be used for quasi-particle energy. It's doing a mess. And you might say, why should we care? So one is an example where we should care is this charge transfer excitation. Let me show you why. We, for charge transfer excitation like between benzene and PCME, we have this theory due to Mulliken from the 50s. The energy for the charge transfer excitation must equal the ionization potential from the donor minus the electron affinity of the acceptor minus the interaction between the electron and the hole. That's one over R. It's exactly what they showed about GW theory. And, um, but if you do uh, time dependent Konchan theory, you find out that the photon energy is predicted to be the gap, the Konchan gap, LUMO minus HOMO. And we already know that this gap is much smaller than this gap. And also, we're missing this one over R. So, all in all, you, we will usually not have the correct charge for excitation energy because of two reasons. One is that the band gap is incorrect, and the other is that there's no 1 over R dependence. Sometimes you might have this 1 over R compensating for the difference between these two, but usually this difference is too big to be compensated by the 1 over R. There are other reasons why you want to have the correct orbitals. We can show that it relates to this problem where um, uh, symmetric biradicals don't get the correct energies. We can show that they are related to exaggerated polarizability in long systems. We can show that, that incorrect um, energy levels, incorrect orbital energies, give uh, exaggerated conductance in molecular junctions because the levels are too small and the barriers for tunneling are too, too small as well. And also, we can show that Wittberg excitations cannot be predicted correctly because of the HOMO not being placed at the right place. And there are more. I will not go into all the details. 
Another related issue is the issue of curvature. If we calculate the Kronschalm energy as a function of the fractional number of electrons in the home of orbital, like for this carbon atom, we can uh, uh, carbon has six electrons, but we can also put in the QCAM or whatever program we can say that there are less electrons in the home mode, then we find out that the total energy has a curvature. You see this green line, that's with the LDA, the curvature is very large. Also, Harvey Fock has a curvature, but negative. LDA has positive. Theory tells us that actually there should be no curvature. It should be a straight line, zero curvature. Now, what we found out recently in a recent paper cited here is that because of the curvature that we just saw, um, the curvature actually places this gap in this place where the homo is shifted up and the lumo is also shifted up. Instead of looking like this, it looks like this. So actually this curvature is playing the exact role of the derivative discontinuity. And half of the curvature is equal to half of the derivative discontinuity. So the curvature is the missing derivative discontinuity in this in, the, in all these functionals. And we have shown in this recent paper that no matter which functional you use, you can always use to very good accuracy these two formulas to correct the homo energy relative to the ionization potential. All you need to know is the curvature. So this is, uh, this you can see that uh, the theory is very accurate. I will not go into all the numbers, but whoever is interested can read this paper. And um, if we want now a DFT theory in which I equals the homo energy, now we know what we have to do. We have to look for a theory in which the curvature is zero. So can we find a theory where the curvature is zero? One way to do this is to use wage-separated hybrids. These are hybrids between exact exchange with, with some decaying function that only stresses the long-range exchange and another part of the exchange is local. And the range where you switch between local and, and, and long range exchange is determined by this parameter, which we call gamma. In QCAN, it's called omega. So gamma uh, is a free parameter of the theory. And what we suggest is to use it to get zero curvature. Or in other words, we set this gamma in order to get the homo energy equal to the ionization potential to get this ionization potential theorem. So we look for gamma that makes the homo energy equal to the delta ICF ionization potential. And uh, we can do that. In principle, this has to hold for all charged states of the molecule. We do it for the neutral and the anion, because those are the two frontier cases which are most important for the, for the uh, properties we're interested in in material science and in uh, chemistry and electrochemistry and um, ke uh, fields like that. So what we do is we define a functional J of gamma, which is, is strictly zero when the two IP theorems are exactly obeyed, since we can't hope to obtain two conditions with just one parameter, we minimize this J. And what I would like to do now is to ask Tamar Stein to take over and to teach us how to do the tuning using QCAN with the script that she has written, or several scripts, and uh, to actually obtain this optimal value of gamma. So I'm going to transfer the speaking, the present, I'm going to make the man now a presenter. Okay. Okay, thank you, Rui. So I will now explain how um, how we actually do this tuning procedure. So we already mentioned that we need to tune the range of separation parameters in order to have orbital energies uh, with meaning, with physical meaning. So what we in practice want to do, we want to set, and we have in the range separated uh, functional, we have three parameters here. We want to set it so that the home of energy will equal to the ionization potential of the N-electron system. And we can have a similar condition of the 
sum of the n plus 1 of right one system. This should be equal to the ionization potential of the n plus 1 system or the electronegativity of um, the n system. This also gives us a way to set this free parameter in a way which is a um, ab initial way and not an empirical way. So um, we can do it with the parallel script that uh, is in Houston between the golden set and serve. Now, um, the idea here is that we bracket the minimum. We start with three points, um, A, B, C, such that the F of B is less than both F of A and, and F of A and F of C. So we, we know that this function has a minimum in the interval A and C. So next, the algorithm chooses a new point, F, a new point, F. And suppose this new point is between uh, B and C. We now evaluate the F of F. Now, if F of B is smaller than F of F, then the new bracket and triplet are A, B, and F. And if it is larger than F of F, if F is larger than F of F, then now we know that the new bracketing uh, is B, X, and C. So we continue this procedure until uh, we get the minimum. Um, so in the in the script, we have the routine that's called the minimum. We need to call this routine, and we need to give it the initial bracketing. So in this example, um, my script is bracketing are 100, 500, and 800. And of course, if I if I have a, a good idea where the um, optimal value of gamma is, I can give a smaller bracketing, and then uh, it will converge quickly. But you should be careful because if the minimum is not in the range that you gave um, the script, then of course it will not find uh, the minimum. So in I in this example, if the value of the minimum is less than 100 or higher than 800. Uh, then the script will not find the correct minimum. So uh, if you get 100 or 800, as a result, this should uh, be a warning. Now, this should be enough for organic molecules, for example, but I think atoms uh, you might want might have a larger value of the range separation parameter. So um, in order to calculate this J function, and we need, the script needs several information from Q. So first of all, we need uh, the homo energy of the N plus 1 system and the homo energy of the N system. And we need the total energies of the N and N minus 1 system to calculate the ionization potential. And um, total energies of the N and N plus electron system to calculate the ionization potential of N uh, plus 1 electron system. And we need it for each value of gamma, we need all this data. So the script does that for us. It runs QFIM uh, calculation in different uh, value of gamma. So we need to prepare the initial file. Uh, we have three files for this example, m.in, n.in, and c.in. Um, so these files represent the same system, but the m is the anion. Uh, the neutral is the neutral, and C is the cation. So they are differing the spin and multiplicity. And the script will make a multiplication of this uh, file with different values of the range separation parameter and, make, and will run Q. Uh, and for each, um, each gamma, it will calculate J. So um, the REM section of the file should look like this. This is general REM section of QFIN. This is to work with the BNL functional. Omega is the range separated parameter. And this, this is the only part in the input that the script changed, only this value of omega. Now, a very important point that you have uh, in the way the script written, you have to have printing um, level of print, SCF final print equals C. If you don't have this, the script will not be able to read the orbital energies correctly. And of course, you should know the spin of them and the multiplicity of each, uh, each file. And we can go ahead. Now, the script make a run with a different gamma. And then when all the QKIM the QKIM um, uh, finished to run, it uh, takes the output and it looks for the 
following expression. So there are uh, this and this alpha and beta electron. This is how the script knows how many electrons I have and knows what is the homo, what is the lumo, and because he reads this one. Here's the energy after convergence. So we, we look for this kind of uh, expression. And of course, final alpha MO eigenvalues, and find if it's not a single, then also the final beta MO and the eigenvalues. Now, we know that these two only, you get only printed if you have the SCF uh, final print equals three. So if everything in the output file, the script will be able to read it and calculate uh, J of gamma. Okay, sorry. So make sure your output files have all the above expression, otherwise the script will not work. I will emphasize it once more. Now the script uh, was written for Qkin uh, 3.2. So if there are changes due to different versions of Qkin, you will need to change the script accordingly. And obviously if you change different levels of printing or anything to change the, um, um, the expression I showed, you will need to make changes in your script. And of course, you need to make sure that all of your QT runs are converged, because if it's not converged, we don't have the total energy, and um, what the script is really is wrong. So check that. And also, it is very important, although the script is automatically to open output file, so the QT doesn't give you any additional warnings, see so that everything went uh, OK with the calculation. So, uh, for example, I will uh, take this uh, humorine dye that uh, used for dye synthesized solar cell. This is the uh, NKE2388, which is the short name of it. And um, it consists of a donor part and an acceptor part and have an intermolecular charge transfer. So I prepared um, three input files, m in, m in, and p in. And this is the um, the name you should give the files because this is the file the script looks for. And as you can see, the script make a lot of uh, duplication of this file. Each number it's number them according to the order uh, of run. So um, each number is a different value of, of the range separation parameter uh, within the file. So we have uh, all the, uh, all those files here. Now you can use the print uh, script to print the relevant data uh, of all of this output. Oh, sorry. So here is uh, the gamma, the energy of the neutral, the energy of the theta, and the energy of the anion. This is the lumo energy, the homo of the anion, and the homo of the neutral. Now having all this data, you are not limited to the um, J function that the script but you can also tune only for the ionization potential, for example, or any other flavor of tuning that uh, you need. And this is the output for this example. So you see that here is, uh, you will see that the script converged to 202, the range separation parameter value. And uh, this is uh, J versus gamma. This is the function versus gamma. And you see that we, here we get uh, a minimum um, predicted. So uh, thank you. We'll now uh, hear from from our E of uh, another example of very very important to do this uh, tuning procedure. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so now it's Roy Bear back, and thank you, Tamar, for showing us how to perform the tuning uh, in QCAM. Let me uh, show very briefly some of the results that you can get from tuning. For example, if you look at gaps of atomic systems, which are very difficult to get with density functional theory, you can see, for example, these are gaps of various atoms. The gaps, I mean ionization potential, uh, a homo minus lumo. And you can see that, uh, um, for example, PBE gaps are here, very low in energy. 
also the gaps of V3 leap are, are higher, but pretty low. Uh, the experimental gaps are these brown dots, and the crosses are the uh, gaps that you get when you do tuning for each atom separately. And the numbers here tell you what are the value of omega or gamma that are needed to achieve this gap. So you see that for different atoms, you have very different values of the orbital of the of gamma. And so the tuning is really essential if you want to get the orbital energies to correspond to the ionization potentials. Also for molecules, here you can see um, the gap as a function of a number of rings. And uh, we also plot here reference values of the uh, quasi-particle gap. So they are reasonably close. And again, as the system grows, gamma changes, and it usually drops as the size of the oligomer grows. And <clears throat> we also tested this on silicon clusters, starting from the molecule, silane molecule 2, up to a large silicon cluster, silicon 147, hydrogen 100. And we plot here the ionization potential and the electron affinity. And we also plot GW values. And we assume that the GW values are good approximations to the correct values, because there are no experiments for the largest clusters. And we see that, indeed, we fit the GW theory quite well. For the smaller systems, there's also experiments, and we fit the experiments very well. And finally, charge transfer excitations. Uh, these are experimental excitations of, of various uh, donors, benzene, toluene, and so on, to TCME. And you can see that the excitation, charge transfer excitation energy can change from 3.6 eV to 2.6 eV. For B3 lip, the energies are much too low. BNL without tuning, which we use the parameter 0 0.5, is too high. While if you do the tuning, then you get very good results, very close to the experimental ones. Also, if you do GW theory complemented with the better or better equations for calculating the electron exciton binding and electron hole binding energy, you also get good results, relatively good results, but they're not as good as the um, DNL results. Um, there are many uses for this theory. For example, if you ionize water, take for example this cluster and you ionize it, and so a whole entire dynamics of the hole starts to develop within a few tens of femtoseconds. And this hole is actually a proton that gets transferred. You see, it used to be here, then it gets transferred to here, and then to here, and then it gets transferred along the chain. And uh, eventually, an OH radical is formed. This is a very important process if you want to understand how radicals are formed in the cell. And uh, you cannot describe this using regular DFT. You have to do this tuning procedure if you want to use DFT. Otherwise, you're in danger of getting the energetics completely wrong. And uh, there are examples that if you use DFT, you get the wrong behavior. Uh, Rydberg excitations. This is the Rydberg excitation of benzene. You have the experimental results of the blue triangles. If you use uh, B3 lip, you get too low by about an electron volt or 0 0.7 electron volt. If you use untuned BNL, you get too high. But if you do the tuning of benzene, then actually the two, the spectra that you get corresponds to the experimental spectra quite nicely. The tuning is BNL star. So let me summarize now. Our goal in this lecture was to get the DFT orbital energies to co approximate quasi-particle energies. And I think I convinced you why that could be useful, even if you're not interested in quasi-particles, especially if you are. If you're treating conductance of transport of electrons, you are interested in these. And you should, if you're using DFT, you should try to get this uh, working. Um, we know from exact quantum theory that the quasi-hole is in the, should be in the correct place, but the quasi-electron is usually off by a large amount, this derivative discontinuity. And accordingly, the gap 
the fundamental gap, I minus A, is different from the Cohn-Sharm gap by the same quantity. What we showed also that this quantity, the delta Xc, is related to the curvature. It's equal to the curvature. And so if you don't want this quantity, you want A and I to correspond to homo and lumo, then you want to look for zero curvature. And we showed the procedure, Tamar showed you a procedure, how to find the gamma parameter that gets you close to zero curvature. And then we get good gaps, then we get good charge transfer energy, we get good Rydberg excitations, etc. Uh, let me refer you to some more, uh, to some uh, um, uh, re two reviews, one very recent by Leo Kony. Uh, Tamar Stein, Sivan Rafael Abramson, and myself from a year ago, and one from 2010, uh, uh, myself and, oh, sorry, Esther Lipschitz somehow, I missed this. Esther Lipschitz was then my student, and Ulrike Salzner, and I also want to point you to a recent publication, which I'm not sure is yet, it's already accepted, but not maybe not yet published, which uh, discusses how to get good, um, very accurate uh, photoelectron spectroscopy images using uh, concepts such as uh, this uh, tuning and additional concepts that were recently developed. So thank you very much. Um, thank you, Rai. Thank you, um, Tamar. Um, now it's time for some questions. And I would like to remind all attendees to, um, that you can ask your questions in the um, question under the questions tab. And so far, there are no questions. So I'll start the process. And um, uh, I guess the, uh, my question is for both um, Roy and Tamar uh, regarding um, things like exploring potential potential energy surfaces and geometry optimizations with uh, together with tuning the uh, uh, long range separation parameter so how is the parameter dependent on the geometry and how would I um, say optimize um, the geometry of a molecule um, at the same time tuning the parameter or should I just use one value for all geometry Um, I don't know if you're hearing me. I guess I hope you are. Um, about the question, um, what we found out is that when you change gamma, you drastically change the absolute energy of the molecule. So it is impossible to change gamma while you're doing anything um, uh, with your molecule like uh, optimizing the geometry, etc. So what you need to do is to determine this gamma parameter once in a, in, in a in some average low, average geometry, and then you leave it constant for the entire calculation. If you start playing with this um, uh, with this uh, parameter, you're actually going to get bad results, and we also understand why. The issue is that. Uh, this gamma parameter is, in principle, dependent on the density, and the tuning procedure gives you this dependence. However, if you're going to calculate, you're going to use Kohn-Sharm theorem, actually anything that depends on the density in the total energy should give you a potential. You have to take this derivative when you look at the Kohn-Sharm potential. And this potential, what it does actually is stabilize you, your result. Since we don't have a theory yet, of how to put in this uh, derivative, then we don't get the stabilization. And then you get big jumps in the energy. And therefore, until we develop a theory that knows how to take the derivative of this functional with the respect to the density, we uh, cannot change gamma when we change the position of atoms. Right, thanks. Um, Okay, and then um, I have another question is, 
uh, which is um, so there um, there are many uh, functionals available in QCAM uh, that are range separated functionals. You show all your examples with QNL, but um, I, I just wonder if the same idea would apply to other functionals, or is it unique to VNL? Okay. Um, we have not uh, tested too much this issue. Uh, in Leo Chronics group, I think there was uh, more testing than in our group. And I, there's no reason why the same ideas won't hold for other range-separated uh, hybrids. And even I know that some people are using this idea to tune the, the B3 leap, the parameter of the mixing. Uh, the problem with that idea is that it usually leads to very high mixing coefficients, which, which uh, could be detrimental. But um, uh, the same idea can be used across the board. So for many applications, uh, especially those where you have several weekly interacting systems, it is essential that you do this procedure and uh, one way or another with any functional you can um, that has this long range exchange. Okay, thanks for the answer. Um, I have another question. Um, so in the case of say heterogeneous systems where a system would consist of um, multiple parts and the optimal value of the parameter is different for each part. Um, how would you go about these systems? Uh, would you just um, optimize the parameter for the whole system without looking at the parts, or um, how would you do that? So this is uh, the weak point of the theory. If you have several, two or more uh, parts which have very different gamma, which want to have very different values of the parameter gamma, then there's no good way to set this parameter to satisfy all the constraints. And so for these type of systems, you probably cannot use the method as it is now being proposed. And we need something more refined. Um, often, for example, with the water molecule, uh, what we found is that a very close para uh, parameters w uh, are very close for different systems. Uh, in that case, you can just take the average value and you know not be uh, perfect for any of the two cases. That you can do if the two parameter the optimal parameters are close to each other. But if they're very different, then you you really uh, have to look for another theory, I guess because we have not yet developed anything uh, which is uh, uh, good enough for this case. Um, thank you. And um, rather technical question, um, the, value, um, the, value that we specify, the value of the parameter gamma or omega that we specify in the input file, what are the units? And also in the script, um, the values are something like two, 200 to 800. Um, what are the units? And, um, how do we set them up correctly? In QCAM, the value of the range separation, okay, the, the um, units of the range separation parameters are 1 over uh, the distance, 1 over A0. Now, in QCAM, it's multiplied by 1,000. So 200 is actually 0.2. Okay, so it's 0.2 atomic units. Atomic units, yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, well, um, it looks like there are no more questions, um, so let's maybe wait uh, a few more seconds if someone has any um, question they can submit it. I will add the regarding the question on the um, tuning other uh, range separation functional that um, for our study on the Kumarin dyes, we compared our results to a study done with a different range separation functional. I don't remember which at the moment, but it wasn't BNL, and they uh, they check the value of the um, range separation parameters that give the best result. Now we, with our with our um, tuning procedure, we got we, we got different value because we got um, we use different functions, but we actually got the same, a very similar answer. So I would expect that if they would use our procedure, they will also get the same. 
So the excitation energy was the same, but the value of the parameter could have been different. That's what you're saying. Yes, because it is a different function. But the, the routine, I would guess, work on both. This concludes our webinar. We would like to thank Professor Baer and Dr. Stein for their excellent presentation. If you've not tried QChem lately, we have come a long way, and we invite you to utilize our two-month full-featured demo, which you can request by hitting the orange free demo button on our website. Should you have any questions, please feel free to contact us by emailing either Jinting or Yi Han at the email addresses noted on your screen. We also invite you to visit us on Facebook. Thank you for your participation, and see you at the next webinar.